<laughs> All right. So welcome um, everyone who joined in. Um, if you don't know me, I am attorney Renee Bauer and I am a divorce attorney and podcast host from the Happy Even After podcast. And I am here today with Dr. Leah Lease, who um, you look fabulous, by the way. Oh, my. I was thinking that about you. I was looking at all your Instagram like posts every day, all the time. I'm like, how does she always look so good? Very impressed. Oh, well, thank you. But Photoshop is a wonderful thing oh. <laughs> in, the, in the ring light. So um, I am so really excited to talk to you because you were a, you and I met because you were a um, guest on my podcast um, and your episode is dropping this week, nice. but you have some really exciting news. Um, you have a book coming out and whoever is joining in, just uh, say hello, wave, um, send a little heart, do something like that. Yeah, so I saw you're here in the UK. Thank you. So you have a book coming out called No Shame, and I love this topic so much. So that is the book, no and it is so pretty, and it is so good. Um, it was, it was, I got a chance to read it this week, and I love it, and I have so many questions. Um, so first of all, Let's um, get thank to you it. for being here, and thank you for having a drink with me. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. To no shame. Let's host it to, to living without shame. Here we go. Thank you. All right. I'm going to try to situate my camera so I don't have to hold it the whole time because that would really stink. All right. Let's see if I can do this. I was all set up like 10 minutes ago. And then, um, all right. There we go. We're good. Back in business. And then I was sideways. So, your book is a sex education book, essentially, and it's really how to help talk to your kids or how to talk to your kids about sex. So you're, um, you're also known as the shameless psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And so can you just tell me where that name came from and why this topic for the book? Yeah, the, the, the name came from... Uh me trying to think of something smart to call myself because Dr. D. Francesi Lise is very, very long and very boring. And, um, and I was following this angry therapist and he's really fun Instagram account. I'm like, I should come up with a catchy name like that. And so I thought, well, what, what am I about? And my friend said, well, you're, you're shameless, both because you talk about sex with like shamelessness, you know, but also because you promote not living with shame. And I was like, genius. And then, you know, my friends were like, no, everyone's going to think of that dumb TV show, you know, shameless. And they're going to, and I'm like, nobody's going to think about that. Like, you know, they'll have that one moment and then they'll like leave. Or they're going to think that you're like shameless, like you have no respect for people. I'm like, no, but I think the play on words is kind of fun. And it gives that people that moment to be like, ooh, is she shameless? So, uh -huh. um, and that's why we have so many people joining in right now. Because everyone's like, ooh, shameless. Like, I want to know what she has yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah, I saw uh, Mimosas with Moms. Hi. She's so great. I love her uh, her media outreach and her her children are so beautiful. I'm, I'm so glad you guys are coming on. So what uh, what else can we talk about? Let's, let's All right, so I have a question. Um, and yeah. this is, we're going to talk about a few things. And I want to talk about um, sex. I want to talk about dating after divorce. But I want to talk about... Um, something that most parents have a really hard time having a conversation with their kid about. So how do you talk to your kids about sex and what's the right age to do so? You know, the, the answer is as soon as they can talk. The reality is, is that sex talks need to be ongoing. So like two, three, four, you know, you start introducing like hygiene, biology, you start talking about pleasure. Um, does this feel good? Do you like when I brush your hair? You know, um, and you also start introducing concepts of it's my body and you can, you know, you know, I can decide who touches me. So conversations about nobody's allowed to touch your, your privates between here and here, you know, you can explain what that is with proper terminology, like the, you know, vulva and the, you know, nipples and, and without, you know, without your permission, unless it's the doctor or me and, you know, you really start talking about, um, you know, if in tag, if you don't want people to touch you harder, like how do you want to be touched? And that's really tra like translates to actual such education. Like you're not actually saying 
oh, this is because later on, when you're a teenager, you're going to feel more empowered over your body to decide who touches you and who doesn't. But it sets the stage. Does that make sense? So yeah, you're saying, so oh, I'm empowered. Like, you know, only people can touch me who I want to touch me. That's like such a great lesson from early on. You said something that struck out to me. And as a parent of a teen, and I know most parents who have teens, their conversation about sex is don't get pregnant, don't get a girl pregnant. And you just said pleasure. Like, are we supposed to talk to our kids about pleasure? And how do we do that? Yes. Oh my goodness. Of course. Um, pleasure. So it's the most important part of sex. Don't forget. I mean, yeah, there are dangers and we should talk about them, but that is nothing compared to pleasure. If it wasn't pleasurable, why would we do it with the risks of everything else involved? Like SDIs and, you know, we wouldn't do it and we do it because it's pleasurable and that is, you know, the reality. So why are we like selling them some, like, it's so risky, it's so dangerous. Oh, beware. Because a, they're going to figure out how pleasurable it is as soon as they can learn to masturbate. And B, <laughs> you know. That, when that's when the wad of uh, tissues end up under their bed. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know? And like, why would we like, you know, just fear monger them? So, you know, it creates shame. And so, but pleasure is like more simple than you think. It starts with like, as I said, brushing their hair. Do you like, when I touch you like this, do you like a back massage? Like, you know, it sets up the stage for like, it feels good to be touched. It feels good to allow someone to touch me when I want it. And then you, then you can go into like sexual pleasure and like how, you know, your partner should prioritize your pleasure above their own. If it doesn't feel good, something is wrong. Like sex should feel good. And if you're doing it and it doesn't, you're doing it for the wrong reasons or it's not right. And you have to think about why. Right, right. And what about setting boundaries and teaching them about that in both boys and girls and, and how to set boundaries and how to use their voice and express that? Um, yeah, I mean, that's so great. Like the, the concepts of setting boundaries from a young age, like, you know, um, how do you like, to, you know, if, 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 if a boy or a girl like spanks another boy or a girl, it's like you parent and you immediately have to get in there and be like, that is, you know, do not touch someone like that. They did not give you permission. And actually, I said, I, with my children, I am, or other children, like, and I model this to parents all the time, but if a little girl, a little boy comes to my office, or I meet, you know, of a, of a friend, I'll say, you know, if I don't know them, I'll say, can I give you a handshake? And I'll see what they say, and I'll say, what about this bump? And, and, and if they say no, I'm like, okay, you know, no touches, you say no touch, no touch, and I modeled that. And I think that you can model that too. Like, can I give you a hug? You know, do you want a hug? Can I give you a hug? And if they say no, don't like, I don't like, there was an article in the New York Times recently about, about force tickling and how like in our culture, yeah. we like tickle kids without their permission. It's just not right. Like you could say, can I tickle you? Can we play the tickle game? And if they're into it and they want to be tickled, great. But like, don't force them. It's such a long message for girls too. Like, they're, they have to take what's given to them rather than uh, having command over their body. You know? I mean, what, what about even to having kids hug, like young kids hug when, when they don't want to? Like, I know my son, for example, was like not a hugger. And I used to and be like, oh, just hug, you know, give them a, a goodbye hug. And is that a bottle of tequila that you're pouring? Yeah, <laughs> it's a happy hour. Um, and are you supposed to force your kids who aren't comfortable with that to hug a relative goodbye, for example? Or is it okay for them to, to for you to say, sorry, he's, he's not a hugger and that's okay and it's not rude? Yeah, I think you just, you, you set the expectation for the adult, like, you know, the granny would, you know, be like, you know, he doesn't like to be touched like that. Like, you know, Johnny, what would you like to do to say goodbye? Do you want to wave? Or do you want to do a fist bump? So you can offer choices and you could say like you're in control. And I really don't think it's a great idea to let, you know, that great aunt go like this or smack, you know, it's hug them too hard or crush their bones or tickle them. It's, it set up, it set up the wrong expectation for that. They are in control of their body from the start. And, um, you know, it, you, as a parent, you should model that. You should also not allow your partner to slap or, you know, like joke around, do those things to you either because it's the wrong example, you know? So you really want to model that even in your own relationship. So, you know, um, you be conscious of how, you know, what 
if they're just like spanking your ass in the kitchen as a joke, like it's not the right <laughs> message when you're trying to tell your kid not to do that, right? To right. other kids. So you got to be a good role model too. And that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. <laughs> so when they go to school and try to do that, like that's not, <laughs> they're like, well, my dad does it to my mom all the time. <laughs> exactly. No. All right, so let's switch up the conversation. And a, a lot of people that I deal with are going through a divorce and have gone through a divorce and they're going back out into the dating world. And it is a big, scary, very different world out there right now. So how does someone approach dating in this day and age, pandemic aside, and how do they regain uh, confidence and put themselves out there and really just enjoy being intimate with someone again after it's been a while of, um, of maybe that wasn't happening in their marriage. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Uh, it, 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 it's probably quite terrifying to like open that door again after you, you, you may have had so much problems in your marriage, you kind of shut the door down. I would say that, um, I would say it's like baby steps. Like you don't need to like, you know, eat the whole enchilada. Um, one thing that one advice I give a lot of my millennials and younger patients, I mean, older patients for me, um, is that the first part of dating should be fun. And if all you're doing is stressing over being rejected, there's no fun in that. And, you know, it's, it's about managing your expectations. Like, you know, if you really like the person and it doesn't work out, you're no worse off than you were before, right? Before you met them. So, you know, if you're just going to spend the entire three, first three months of your relationships worrying whether or not the person's going to call you then or if you said the right things, what? there's no pleasure or fun in that. So you got to put those thoughts aside and just say to yourself, I'm going to like be in this to have fun and to experience pleasure. And if it doesn't work out or they betray my trust or whatever, like I've learned that this person is not for me, you know, and that sucks and it's, Painful, and I'm gonna maybe watch a sad movie and cry, or call my friends and share uh, do bonus. But I am not going to let it ruin the time we had together. And then you know, everyone's like, "Oh, trust issues, trust issues." I was cheated yeah. on. I was in da -da -da. I such trust issues. And I want to be like, "You're gonna let that be your story? Like some guy cheating on you, or a girl cheating on you, and that's now your story? That's that's your stigmata? You know, your scarlet letter? I mean, you're an, you're a great person, like." that's not your story. Your story is like, it didn't work out. I'm open to the next opportunity. That's your story. So what narrative are you going to feed yourself? Like, how are you going to nourish yourself with that? Like, Oh, he cheated on me and now I trust you story. Or is it going to be like, Oh, that was not for me. I, you know, just not the right person. And you know, I'm so glad I got out of it. I always say to people, you know, patients like this, you know, a guy cheats on you and breaks up with you and you're devastated. Like you think the world is gonna end, you're so heartbroken. Well, it's all about perception. If the next day you learn that guy was like an ax murderer with a like criminal record, you'd be like, phew, got off easy. Mm -hmm. So my point is it's all about perspective. It doesn't matter what happened, it's about how you interpret it. So in your book, you talk about owning your sex story. What is yes. that? Mm. You ask awesome questions. <laughs> owning your sex story is like, um, it's a combination of like, what is your sexual history, right? And, you know, what happened to you in the past? And, you know, what worked out, what didn't work out? And what is the spin you want to put on it? I mean, again, if you want to put the spin of everybody hurts me, I've been rejected, I got divorced, I'm a failure, fine. But that's not a story that's going to lend to great parenting, first of all, because you'll come at it from a very negative perspective but also will not serve you well in life in general. So you spin it, you know, like spin the story to be as positive as you can and come up with ways to give, feed yourself a new narrative, a more positive one, mm -hmm. because every psychological study from CBT to DBT to all this, all talks about perspective and perspective is everything. And we are being fed so much information into our brains. How do we want to filter it? Do we want to filter it through this like awful negative lens of everything sucks and I'm, and I can't trust and I'm not worthy? Or do we want to filter it from an entirely different lens? And if you filter it through a rational lens, which means fair and balanced, you're more likely to be happy. And what part do you want to be happy or do you want to be miserable? Because if you want to be miserable, then hang on to that distrustful narrative. If you want to be happy, give it, give that up and change the narrative. Ah, so don't, you know, don't be the victim. 
And I no. think that so many people going through divorce like to point the finger at their spouse and say, well, he or she is the reason for all of my misery. Yes. And they want to blame them. And those are the people who get stuck and they can't move forward. Yeah, well, Esther Pearl's book, State of Affairs, talks about that. There is really no victim. And even if you got cheated on, you're not the victim, right? right. There are so many factors that led up to that. You know, you may have been, you know, unaware of the person's needs, whatever it is. And there's just that narrative is such a simple narrative. And it really hurts your kids, too, because they hear that narrative and they buy into that narrative and then it alienates the other parent. I mean, it's just a disaster all around. Like, yeah. I mean, people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You couldn't live with the mistake, which is why you got divorced. You could write. So someone dropped a comment in the box. Yes, we will um, save this recording so you can watch it again and it will be on both of our feeds. Awesome. We're done. It, so this idea of, um, of toxic pos uh, positivity is out there and it's like constantly um, pointing the finger at someone else saying you're going to like pull yourself up without really addressing kind of like your own shit in all of this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important to own what you brought to the breakdown of the relationship or the marriage so that mm. you don't repeat history time and time again. Because I love that toxic positivity. That's a new one for me. Whoever wrote that in. It wasn't me. <laughs> I'm just, I mean, I never did I come up with it. <laughs> Which is why I would say not positive, but rational. So that means like, it's not like this like hunky dory, like everything's great. Like I don't have any problems. That's, that's passive aggressive, you know, that's passive aggressive because you, you know what that is, right? Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's just the opposite end. It's just being passive aggressive. I'm really good at that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I ain't got no problems. These are your problems. Like I ignore you. Right. And get really enraged. You know, and then I'll be like, see, I knew you were an angry person. That's passive, but that's not good either. You know, I think it's more like rational, which means yeah. fair and balanced. Like we all have a role to play in why things didn't work out. It's no blame game. You know, right. it's like, okay, what role did I play? What role did you play? Can, can we make it work anyway? Or is it done? You know, if it's done, let's move on. Let's figure out how to be friends. Let's do our best to be co-parents. And uh, if, it's, if it's not time to move on, then how can we forgive and learn and grow, change the yeah. narrative? I mean, the, the statistics are not good for second and third marriages. And I, I feel like that in my own just sort of, take on it is, is that because we keep making the same mistakes over and over again and we're not we're not owning our stuff and I think that goes to kind of owning your sex story yes true it's all about all right that. so let's let's um flip the script a little bit let's talk about someone's divorce they're back out in the dating world things are getting serious they got through that three months and everything is great and now they want to introduce their children how do you go about doing that in the most healthy um, way possible for your kids. I am, uh, I am, let's just begin some of the old comments. But I think that um, how you can do that is, you know, you have, you married that person for a reason. Like, I really feel like you did. And so therefore, you cannot, you have to put some faith in their decision making. Um, I know it's scary to trust a new person into your kid's life. But it, as best you can, if you can embrace that other person and have some kindness and empathy towards their story, that would be useful. I always say, like, you know when your kid is born and you're, like, you know, your, your husband or man is going to be out of change a diaper in your hand and he just, like, puts it on backwards. Like, and you're like, oh, God, he, put he didn't do it right. And you're like, yeah. you know what? It's not going to kill the kid. So the diaper's on backwards. I feel like it's the same way step parents, like, Maybe they'll take them to McDonald's and you're a vegan. I mean, mm. and that like irks you, but you're like, McDonald's not going to kill the kid. You know, what is going to kill the kid is if I bash this person and I put my, yeah. my ex partner down and I tell the, my child not to get to know the other person, unless you have real credible evidence that the other person is dangerous. That's a different story. Not like you just don't like them or you feel like, you know, insecure then, you know, let the relationship flourish. More parents is more parents. I only have three parents, you know, and three parents to take them to ball games or take them to ice cream or, you know, and exploit that. Like, it can be a real advantage. It doesn't have to be a disadvantage. 
So should you be introducing your ex to this new person in your life before the kids meet them? I don't recommend that. I recommend that you just tell the ex you're going to do it. I don't like, I don't, I never like to have the kids be the bearer of messages like, oh, I met my um, daddy's new girlfriend. You know, I don't want the kids to be play that role or have that responsibility. However, I don't think the ex has to meet them first because they don't get to decide. What if they would say, I don't like this person? You know, it's not up to them. They're divorced. You're, you know, it's over. So, or whatever, if you're separated. But you do have to tell the other person. I don't think it's fair to let the kids do it because that will set up the stage of the parent being shocked. And being, what? What right. happened? Hurt you? And you don't want to have the kid be a spy and put them in that position. So I think you just notify them it's happening. Introduce the child. And then you go back to the, you know, ex-partner and say, you know, just let me know if the kid has any questions or concerns or is feeling upset, like, so we can work through it. And, like, that's it. That's all you're obligated to do. And I think eventually it would be nice if you can be, you know, if you can be like my my husband's parents uh, and step-parents got along great. They went on vacations together. They were really good friends. And it was an absolute inspiration. And now my daughter has, you know, my daughter's have three grandparents on that side, you know? Awesome. You know? Yeah. And so there was, a, there was a question that came through on any tips on how to introduce um, your kids to the significant other it is how, how can that, I mean, oh, I like to say that question. doing an activity or something like that, yes. that's fun and outside of the house. Would you agree with that? Yes. And, and there are some really great tips in this book that outlines everything, but you're right. <laughs> I say, start with a neutral t territory, you know, uh, start with like a, park or a museum or a, a, you know something that's fun and interactive like you know mini golf and mm -hmm. then um and then from there you invite the new new person into your home but like as if the two of you were doing that or the three of you the kids so you know me johnny and sarah are gonna invite the new partner into the home and i'm gonna and then you let like little johnny and sarah show them around the house like where, where's the bedroom? What's your favorite chair? Like when it comes to sitting down at the dinner table, even if you've been there before, because obviously you probably have, because you know, you're splitting time with the kids. You just play down and be like, oh, what, where do you sit? And where do you want me to sit? And you know, oh, where do you sit on the couch? I want to sit where you want me to sit. Where would you like me to sit? Oh, can you show me your room? I want to see your, your toys. And you know, as a step parent, you do that, but you also allow the child to feel like they're in control. Okay, Dr. Lise, what if it's a moody teenager and they don't want to talk or meet the other significant other? How do you deal with that? Oh my God, bribery. Teenagers are so... <laughs> More <You> screen know. <laughs> time? <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, okay, if you meet the other, if you meet my new girlfriend, I will, you know, buy you the new shirt you want. Like, teenagers are easily bribed. But like, if you're nice, if you don't like roll your eyes or be nasty, you know, I will, you know, get you that new app you wanted for your or whatever. <laughs> and like teenagers can be like, they're very simple minded in a lot of ways. Like what's in it for me? You know, they're like a nurse, a little bit narcissistic about it. And uh, so you can try that approach and that will often help. And once they kind of let their guard down, it, it will flow more naturally. Like they're just want to be a teenager and rebellious. But once they get past that, hopefully, they will open up and it, you won't need to continually deprive them. But you know, that might be a way to get the foot in the door. Um, if not that way, then it's just like patience, you know, just you say, this is happening. I'm an adult. This is my person. Like you're going to meet this person and that's happening. And you know, you try to like, you know, you just don't get upset when they have a rolly eye, you know, and they're like, <sighs> just be like, this is happening. Okay. I really appreciate your respect. And I would really appreciate if you're not nasty and it would mean a lot to me, but I would try the bribery first. <laughs> That's great advice. Okay. So every parent's nightmare. What happens if your kid walks in on you having sex with either your spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend? We're going to assume that the couple is divorced at this point or separated. <laughs> So how do you deal with that? Um, well, 
Uh, that is great because I think, you know, obviously you should set, you know, boundaries and lock your door and all, but it still happens, right? And none of us, you know, we all kind of remember it from when we were kids, like I do. <laughs> right, every kid and, um, <laughs> and, you know, the reality is they're not stupid. And, I mean, they may, when they're really young, not understand. But to say, like, hey, we're wrestling. Hey, we're wrestling. Hey, we're wrestling. <laughs> you know, that is even more confusing. <laughs> you mean your 16-year-old's not going to believe that you were wrestling? <laughs> I, I mean, even if you were, like, you know, if it's a four- or five-year-old, you're like, oh, we're wrestling. You know? I just think you just be like, oh, we're having some adult time. Can you please leave the room? And then you leave the room, and you lock the door, and then, like, when you're... And then you cry. Probably, probably <laughs> it's finished at that point, the sex. You, you bring like, out the bottle of tequila. <laughs> you're, like, horrified. But then later, you know, it's it's okay to say, like, listen, we were having sex. Adults have sex. This is what, you know, how we experience pleasure. And be like, someday you'll do it, too. But, you know, I'd really res like, appreciate if you would knock and... Um, I hope you're okay. Like, do you want to know more about what sex is or why parents do it? Or, you know, I think it's great just to be honest. Like, I don't know. The whole, like, lying to them and giving them some song and dance is just not, I don't know. It just doesn't set the stage up for great, like, sex-positive parenting. Like, I mean, if you're, if you're having sex with your spouse and you're married or in a very committed relationship, like, that's a beautiful thing. Like, it's not bad. And there are some cultures where they all live in one room. So the kids are seeing it anyway. And like the kids aren't scarred for life, you know, uh, right. they, like, you know, a lot of cultures, they don't have the parents might be scarred though. <laughs> I don't know if you're in a, in a culture with everyone lives in one room, like many cultures out there, you know, they don't have expansive houses because they're fine. Like there's no problem. They learn to like ignore it, ignore the noise, you know, it's just a part of life and it doesn't affect them. So we just make it a big deal here in America because we, we like yeah. internalize this puritanical garbage. But you, it's as big of a deal as you make it. Like, what are they going to see? It's not going to scar them for life. The only reason why it scarred you when you were a kid, if you saw it, is your parents reacted to it and you react to their reaction, right? Right. Hey, Donna. <laughs> She's saying hi. <laughs> That's why you're called shameless. <laughs> yeah. Not everyone has that ability to be completely shameless. I love in your book, you talk about actually like being naked in your house too. And there's like a part of that where you have that conversation. I think you're so right. It's cultural. Like we're all like worried about covering up and not walking around or exposing ourselves. But you have yeah. like some feelings about that too, right? Um, yeah, I think that. By the way, Authentic Parenting Podcast, thank you so much. Yes, it's shameless. And it's so awesome to be just just to own it. I love it. You know, and I love that comment. Um, so, you know, uh, well, what you were bringing up, uh, nudity. Yeah, nudity. I mean, the human body is the human body. There's nothing. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, and then all of a sudden they ate the apple, and they noticed they were... It's really interesting when, I mean, you guys, all the parents who are watching, do you remember the time your kids started to notice they were naked? Like, yeah. And they started getting embarrassed. That made me so sad. I was like, yeah. Oh my, like, it made me sad. Each, for each girl, like, I have two girls, seven and 10. And each time, like, I remember when they were just running around naked, and then one day they noticed they were naked, and I, like, cried. I was like, yeah. Like that, and when they stopped wanting to nurse, because the two times I cried, I was like, eh. you know, it's like, because they internalize these cultural ideals around shame around their body. Look, I'm not saying I want my kid to, to go to school naked or whatever, or join a hippie right. commie, but, you know, I think that being able to see the naked body throughout the life cycle is just healthy. Um, in Northern European countries, they're all like in the hot, you know, sauna together naked it's even the grandparents the, the boyfriend you know the 18 year old girl like nobody thinks twice about it it's just not a big deal and you know i think obviously there are cultural rules around nudity you're not gonna like cook naked so you can burn yourself but like if y'all want to do skinny dipping and your kid's a teenager and you're a 50 year old dad and your daughter is 16 and wants to jump in the pool naked what's the big deal like i don't it, like do it like it's fun so as a divorce lawyer i'm gonna tell you <laughs> that if the other parent 
tries to go to court and says that my ex-spouse let my teen skinny dip with my boyfriend, <laughs> it might be a problem. I agree. So, <laughs> and I think in that case, you can't do it, right? Yeah. You know, and I agree with that. And, and, and it would be a problem. So don't do it. But, you know, I think if you take that aside, if you take the legal issues aside, <laughs> right? you know, there is something very beautiful about it. You know, there's something very free. If you were in France, everybody would be topless on the beach and nobody would bat an eye on Right. You know, it's cultural. So, but yes, you do have to be aware of, of legal issues. And of course, you shouldn't endanger your child's welfare by like putting them in a position. And of course, like you should never allow your child to be in a position where eroticism is in the picture. Let's be clear. Like, you know, this is not like an erotic situation in any way. That's creepy, right? I'm talking about just joyfulness and, you know, nakedness in, in a pure sense. Yeah. Okay. So then how do you assure that your kids, if you are divorced and maybe your kids have seen some conflict and you want to teach them or show them how to have healthy relationships? And I think one of the, the fears is um, if you're going through a divorce is that your child will be in that same cycle and they won't ever know what a healthy relationship is. And so is it possible for a child of divorce to go on and have healthy relationships? And how do we um, model that so that they have the best, um, the best teachers, the best, you know, the best chance of that so they don't end up in the same situation maybe you ended up in? Oh my God, like that is so tough, right? Intergenerational trauma. There's so much of that because we pass down our trauma to our kids. It's so complicated too. It's not just, you know, how we raise them, but also in our epigenetic history. Uh, you know, if we've been traumatized, it gets passed down our genetic code um, uh, through, through how genetics, how the DNA is methylated and stored. Um, so it's even more complicated than just how we raise them. Uh, the only thing I can say is like, read lots of books like this, you know, get help, get therapy. Um, if you've been divorced, you know, obviously you gotta learn from the mistakes that you made in the past and you gotta examine and evaluate and you've gotta help your kid. Like if you see them going down a road you don't like, get them help. Um, because you want them to have sex, healthy sex lives, you want them to be you know, you want them to be happy. So, you know, that's my best advice. But that is a very tough question because it's so layered in, mm. you know, between the genetics and the history and the, you know, the trauma that you experience in your post-traumatic stress. But you can rise above it. Absolutely. And I see it every day. I'm in the change business. You know, I help kids. I help parents. I've changed lives. I know it's possible. You know, I my first patient in residency was a child a 16 year old girl was sexually assaulted by her father. And um, now today she's a therapist. Wow. And Bill writes me every month to tell me how she's doing. You know, there is no way to put anyone in a box. We all can beat up on ourselves. And therapy is really good. Like there's such a stigma still, I think, but everyone needs therapy at least once in their life. Especially oh if they're going through a divorce. Like that's really hard stuff. Oh they need God. support. I don't think anyone should go through a divorce without getting yeah. help, parenting help, because just writing the parenting agreement or co-parenting agreement requires so much compromise. And like, I don't know how you do that without an objective party, unless you're right. truly evolved, which some people are, but right. it's not easy. <laughs> so I am getting to the very bottom of my drink, which means- Yes, I'll thank you very much. We're coming oh. to an end. Uh, Dr. Dr. Lise, that you do. I'm so Tell me, happy that you're out there with, you know, helping families get through their separation. I'm so grateful for you. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm grateful for your book because I loved it. And I read it in a day. Um, it's really good. It is on, you can pre-order it now. And if you're a writer in the publishing world, it's super important for pre-orders. Yeah. But give a, tell people. No shame book. No shame what book. They can find. <laughs> it's more of this, <laughs> but just in words. Yeah, Let's if you go to shamebook.com and you order it and you send me an Instagram uh, messenger, I will send you an ebook to read now. So you have to Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah, so everyone check it out. It's so good. And, and you tackle um, sex and sex education with kids at every age, too, which is really great yeah. um, so that you can 
whether you have young kids or teens, you're really tackling everything and so much more than that. So it's such a great, great book. And you were just on the Jenny McCarthy show. So I yeah. feel like super privileged that you spent the half hour oh, here so with me it's chatting. So <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm so happy that we talked and, um, and thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to being in your podcast next yeah, week. Yeah. So that episode drops on Friday. It's the Happy Even After podcast. So look it up on iTunes. I just listened to the edited version that will get published. And it's awesome because it's more of this. And um, you are awesome. So thank you so much. And cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for, for tuning in.